from the simplest to the rarest of materials. From the barks and fibers of plants to the densest of hardwood. From paper and clay and precious metals to that most wondrous substance, a mind in flight, expressing itself in a torrent of words. These are the materials from which our traditional artisans and craftsmen have built solid and grounded traditions. Fragments of a nation waiting to be made whole by men and women who bring an entire culture and knowledge system into their creations. These are the chosen materials of indigenous craftsmen. They who are the embodiment of Dayao, our knowledge, our pride. Expressive fibers, enduring wood and stone, precious metals. All of these are the materiales fuertes of our traditional craftsmen. Each of these materials express aspirations and dreams of whole communities and societies. But what of the humbler materials like clay and paper? Surely, in their simplicity and accessibility, these two are worthy of artistic creations that reflect facets of a people's personality. Clay and paper. They're simple, humble, accessible. In those very ordinary qualities lies their strength. In the process of transformation, we find the craftsman's joy. The Manungul jar is the most eloquent proof of clay's nobility as a material and its ability to reflect the beliefs and aspirations of a culture. The fact that this clay jar has been declared a national treasure tells us much about how a humble material can be resilient and ennobling. The jar's remarkable lid shows two figures on a small boat. Where are they journeying? Where have they just been? The meaning of these figures is an eloquent proof of the deep spirituality of the early Filipinos. Mary Jane Bolunia, officer in charge and senior researcher at the Archaeology Division of the National Museum tells us about this singular national treasure. So the Manungul chair was discovered in the early part of the 1970s by the team of Dr. Robert Fox in uh, Quezon, Palawan. Uh, Manungul is a rock shelter found in that complex which we now call as Tabon Cave Complex. This jar, which is uh, found in this gallery, was used as a secondary burial jar. So the date of that jar has been placed between 790 to 810, which is part of the Metal Age period of the Philippines. It is the first uh, artifact that shows of our idea or our ancestors' idea of the afterlife because it shows on the lead two people riding a boat or a banka and then one is steering the boat towards the afterlife. So the belief in the afterlife is very much evident in that particular type of artifact. The Manungul jar as well as other examples of the Philippine earthenware or palayok is more than just beautiful objects. They tell us much about the technical knowledge and skill of the ancient Filipino potter. The potter should know what, where to get the clay because the clay must be good because it has to be pounded to remove all impurities and the big uh, fragments of stones and other inclusions that would eventually break the pot once it is fired. Also the knowledge of um, what tools to use. Uh, they have the paddle and anvil, so they have a piece of stone, which is, they have to make sure that it is smooth. And then the paddle, which is a piece of wood, so that to make sure that when they try to tap the pot, it will not create breakage. Then the next is that the knowledge of fire, because they have to make sure that they know the temperature that's going to be reached when they try to fire all those pots or else 
we will have uh, what we call in Tagalog, hindi lutong-lutong palayok or not fully baked. The ordinary palayok or the cooking pot, as the name itself would say, it's a cooking pot. But there are smaller ones that were used exactly or directly for as grave goods, as funerary offerings, and sometimes even for um, rituals. So we have different sizes of pots. And although we call them pots in general, if you take a closer look at them, you find out that they would have different designs. Sometimes they would have different types of lid. An important discovery equal in importance to the Manongol jar would be the Maitom secondary burial vessels. Known for the enigmatic, mysterious faces on the lids of these jars, these vessels are further proof of how important secondary burial was to our ancestors, how they memorialized their beloved dead through these works of art. Secondary burial is being practiced in many communities or even in prehistoric Philippines. That is why we have um, burial jars being found in northern Luzon. When someone dies, he or she is buried. And then after a few years, after all the flesh has been gone, after some time, it's, all, it's only the bones that are left, then they have to, make, to conduct another ritual. And then that is the time that we now have a secondary burial. So the bones of the dead would be placed in a jar and then kept in high places because if they are in high places, that means it is nearer to the afterlife. Looking at the Maitum treasure trove, we cannot help but ask, who are these people depicted here? Who love them enough? to commit their features to memory? And how did these vessels memorialize relationships, immortalize love, heal a loss? I would like to believe that it's more of the um, part of the deceased face or the emotions being expressed because uh, although this would be um, deducing from earlier uh, readings because we don't know what the potter would have uh, thought of but going with the uh, ethnographic uh, interviews that I have done in some of my researches it's always about the dead and not with the Anitos. Even if secondary burial is no longer practiced the tradition of creating strong resilient vessels continues today. Among the Kalinga of the Cordilleras, sturdy vessels are still made today from mountain clay. Such vessels are used to hold water or rice. They are also potted so that when placed on a basket and cloth headpiece, the pots can be balanced easily. In vegan, the making of the Ilocos Burnay still continues today. Artifacts made of clay endure and tell us much about the people who create them. 
objects of paper mache may have a more ephemeral nature, but they are equally eloquent witnesses to the whimsy, the fantasy, the sheer joy of the folk artist. The Gigantes of Angono Rizal are a joyful expression of wit, folk art, and pageantry. These huge mannequins are paraded in threes during festivals. Lore has it these mannequins depict the mestizo landlord, his wife, and their child in a predominantly agricultural and fishing community like Angono. The image of a feudal landlord made comical is particularly resonant. Arturo Argana is a craftsman in a native of Angono. Ang higante, hindi sa bayan ng Angono, nag mula yan dahil sa kapistahan ng San Clemente. Uh, bilang pasas uh, pasalamat sa mga nakuhang biyaya, pagkaya sa dagat, uh, sa bukid, ginawa namin na pagkaya nagpaparid, nandiyan yung mga aning palay, mga isda, ayan. Bata pa ako nun, uh, nakikita ko na na meron kaming tatlong higante dito sa bayan ng Anggono. Yung gumagawa niya ng higante dito sa bayan ng Anggono na si Katem yung Tahan, isa siyang balbero. Uh, nakikita ko, bago siya maggupit, uh, nagagawa siya ng higante. Nagkaedad na ako, sabi ko, gumagawa siya ng higante. E ako, itiga ang gono rin, anak ako ng gono, bakit hindi ko siya gayahin? Uh, para ang higante, lalong dumami at uh, maging uh, kaigay-gaya sa mga bumibisita sa gono. Ang paggawa kasi ng ulo ng higante, dati nakikita ko sa kanila, gumagamit sila ng screen. Tapos, sinuhulma nila doon, lalagyan ng paper masi, uh, matagal ang proseso, saka mabigat. Uh, dapat sa paggawa ng ulang higante, gumamit ng clay. Ang paggawa ng uh, isang higante, dito, oh, uh, puro kami recycle dito. Wala na sasayang. Ang ulo, paggawa ng uh, ulo ng higante, kumukuha kami ng putik ng anay, huhulmahin ko. Pag nahulma, gumagamit din ako ng papel. Papel muna, paper masi muna, saka yung uh, raisin. At uh, uh, pagkatapos nun, nakagawa na ako, magagamit ko pa uli yung putik na yon At ang uh, katawan naman, ang paggawa naman ng katawan, yung aluminum kasi nababaluktot lang. Pag nabaluktot, oo natin lang, nagagamit sa susunod na taon at susunod pa mga taon. Pag naputol, uh, niniribit lang, okay na uli. Magagamit na uli. Ino Manalo, Director of the National Archives of the Philippines and a scholar of Filipiniana, analyzes the meaning and significance of the Angono Higantes. Yung Higante ay mestizo or Castila ang kanyang mga, yung kanyang anyo, yung kanyang muka. May maliit na bata, may, asa, may babae at may lalaki. At pag-aalala ko, eh, kalbo pa yung lalaki. No? So, yun, yun pa lang, umiira lang yung tanong na bakit ganun ang tsura. No? At may nagsasabi, sila na rin ata nagsabi kasi nga gusto daw nila uh, parang gawing katawa-tawa yung mga Kastila. So, no, parang ano nila yun, parang paraan na balikan yung mga Kastila. Current developments have seen Higantes with metal frames and fiberglass heads. Ino Manalo believes that these developments do not hold true to the tradition and essence of the Higantes. Makikita mo ta na taliwas sa tradisyon ng Higante na naging uso ang paggawa ng Higante na gawa sa sa bakal. May mga bagong pinagawa ng mga higante dahil sa isang isang parang government program no na ang ginawa ng mga higante ay gawa sa bakal no. At makita mo dito na taliwas sa tradisyon na kawayan na maging magaan at kumbaga pliable ang kawayan. Pangalawa, uh, taliwas din ito sa katangian ng mga mga sining ng bayan na dahil nga gawa sa bakal, naging permanente. Samantalang marami sa mga sining sa mga pamayanan ay hindi permanente. Nabubulok at bumabalik sa lupa, tapos ginagawa uli. 
no? Kung ka- kailangan na. So, walang parang masasabi sa Ingles, innate value, yung taal na nahalaga. No? Pero, ito ay binubuo uli, binubuhay uli pag may pista. Kaya, pag may pista, nadadagdagan din ang dating ng higante kasi naging buhay. No? Umiikot, tumatakbo, nakikihalibuilo sa mga tao. So, naging buhay. Just as the Higantes of Angono have undergone significant changes, so have another wonder of paper mache, the taka of Paete in Laguna. These whimsical, gaily colored figures depict dalagas and binatas, horses and roosters. Originally conceived as toys, taka has now become iconic symbols of the joyful spirit of Filipino folk art created by the women folk of Paete. Nora Kadawas is a Paete craftswoman specializing in taka. Natuto ako ng pagtataka nang ako ay graduate na elementary ang kalapit bahay ko nagtataka ng mga kabayo. Nag-observe ako at saka pinagbasta ko kung anong proseso ang gagawin. Eh di, na, doon ako natuto. Dito sa Paete nagsimula yung pagtataka dahil yung ang kabalitaan noon ng araw ay eh, meron daw isang matanda na nahulugan ng Matigas na bagay sa ulo. Nag-isip yung matanda na palitan yung bumaksak na yun. Kaya ang unang-unang ginawa niya ay nagpagawa siya ng takaan na dalaga. Ay di na kuha na nga yung magaan. Ayun ang simula noon. Tapos ay di sari-sari nang kuha na yung pinagagawa. Ba't ibang hayop na? Yung pagtataka ay ang gamit niyo na may pinatad na, har- na bigas sa gabi, ibabatad yun. Tapos na mabatad yun sa kinabukasan, kinigiling. Pero pwede rin substitute doon ay harina. Tapos, may bilad sa araw yung takaan. Pag natuyo na yan, binabaki yan sa may legs, sa ganito, sa, sa, basta sa katawan, para mahahati at saka mo yung pulmaan. Ang proseso nito, pagtataka, tapos makubera mo yung lahat ng surface nito, takaan, ay yun ay binibilad sa araw. Pag malaking ganito, dapat yung mga dalawang araw. Pero pag maliit lang, pwede lang lang sa araw. Eh, naisipan namin magtinda sa pakil, sa trumba sa pakil. Yung mga trumba sa pakil, ang dumadayo doon mga taga-reson. Ang kanilang ginagawang souvenir ay mga kabayo. Kaya yun doon nagsimula ang pagkukuha namin ng kabayo. Though whimsical and ephemeral, such works of art deserve to be studied, supported, and promoted for them to survive. For them to cross over to even deeper meanings. Traditional Filipino sensibilities dictated that the presentation of food be a visual feast, an activity that engaged the recipient and showed the care and attention that the host put into every delicious morsel. Nowhere is this sensibility, this hospitality, more fastidiously seen than in the Yema wrappers of Bulacan. Borlas de Pastillas is a name given to the intricate lacework confections of Papel de Japon. Nati Ocampo Castro, who learned the craft from her mother, tells us how she learned the craft. Anak po ako ni Nanay Luz, yung talagang gumagawa po ng pamalat ng pastillas or borlas de pastillas po ang tawag nila. Ang borlas de pastillas po ay nagsimula or influences sa atin nung mga Meksikano, ang tawag nila ay papel picado. At saka po yung sa China, yung Jiangxi yata ang tawag nila doon. Later po, naituro dito sa Pilipinas. Uh, sabi ng Nanay Luz, nung elementary sila, tinuturoan sila ng borlas, ng teacher. So, ngayon po wala na. Wala na sa school ng curriculum nila yan. Sa memories yan, pattern niya, ganun. Tapos yung, nung nag-uumpisa ako, uh, kasi nga, baguhan pa lang, hindi pa masyadong kinis yung ano, 
paulit siya ng paulit sa akin. Hanggang hindi ko ma-fair pick yung gusto niya mangyayari. Gusto niya kinis eh. Kasi bisa magugupit ka, medyo magaspang pa yung daan ng gunting. Ay, sabi niya, hindi pwede yan. Ulit, ulit hanggang masanay, masanay. Ayun na, fair pick ko naman na, ano, na makinis na. The Borlas de Pastillas that Nati and her workshop creates have found a ready audience. An audience that appreciates the ephemeral, delicate beauty of her work, as well as the luscious sweetness of the pastillas. The irony is that to get to the sweet pastillas, the wrapper must be destroyed and disposed of. But in such ironies lie the very strength of the folk art tradition. Folk art is of primary importance in our culture because if you look at folk art, they give a chance to people of all, in all walks of life to participate in artistic creation because there are no barriers in terms of cost because folk art can vary from least expensive to more expensive ones. Now there's, there's a, there are many available materials like paper, wood, even some stones, no, that can be used for folk art. In other words, it's accessible to everybody. If you like more elaborate ones, you can do that if you like to spend more. Uh, but uh, even if you have no money, even if you don't have the more expensive materials like oil paints and uh, watercolor, you can use organic dyes or many, many materials available in your environment or whatever is available, you can create folk art. This is one reason. Folk art is accessible to the people. Secondly, folk art is biodegradable because it uses biodegradable materials. So what is the advantage of being biodegradable? It doesn't clog the earth with so much trash and therefore cannot lead to global warming. Anything biodegradable gives you a chance to create a new because if what you think you create is permanent, then soon there will be no place for you to display. There will be no more space for you to display the permanent object that you have created. While when everything is biodegradable, you will have another chance to create something different, something new. And so it will give you a chance to practice your creative ability. Playful wit, I find it in a brightly colored taka or in a self-mocking higante. When I look at Maitum portraits, I see gravitas, whimsy, fond remembrance of a departed loved one. When I am offered a finely wrapped yema, I don't even want to open it. I could stare at a delicately cut wrapping forever. Objects made from humble, simple clay and paper. But why do I feel sometimes I know the makers so well that I can identify with their spirit, their energy, their humor, their pure, unadulterated Pinoy joy? They represent a different side, a more human, a more spontaneous reflection of Dayao, our knowledge, our pride. <laughs>